Hello, New York Giants fans, and welcome to a new edition of the Valentine's Views podcast here on Big Blue View Radio, part of your SB Nation family of podcasts. I'm your host, Ed Valentine of Big Blue View. Please like, share, and subscribe if you're watching us on YouTube, and subscribe wherever you're listening to podcasts across the Big Blue View Radio network. All right, just a, a quick note for those of you watching on YouTube, I apologize for the uh, the video for the fact that uh, that the top of my beautiful bald head is cut off in the, in the video that you're seeing but uh playing a little bit hurt tonight been uh, been bothered lately by a by a sore back one of those things that happens when you get to be 63 years old and I'm doing the show standing up tonight did the best I could to uh, to try to make the uh, the video as good as possible, as clean as possible, but a uh, little bit of an issue with the with, with the cropping of my big old bald head, and I apologize for that. But still wanted to bring you guys some some content uh, for your uh, for your Wednesday as uh, as the Giants get ready to face the Los Angeles Rams in Week 17. Two more games to go. No guest for you guys today, so you just get to listen to me for a little while. A few things that uh, that I wanted to talk about regarding your Giants as the season comes to an end. And I guess the first thing, the place that we'll start, ESPN's Jordan Renan was on the Michael K show. I believe that was on Tuesday. And, and Jordan spoke a lot about head coach Brian Dable. Jordan had some interesting things to say about Dable perhaps losing some equity inside the Giants building, perhaps uh, wearing thin on at least some members of the coaching staff, if not some players. Jordan referred to Dable as high strung, which is obvious. Watch him on the sideline and you can see that he's a powder keg that he's ready to explode. Watch him enter the press conference from Monday after the loss to the Eagles. Watch him slam that door. Watch his his abrupt demeanor. You can tell he was angry. You can tell he had been worked up before he even entered the room and that he was still emotional. He was still fired up. He hadn't settled down yet. So, Dable is is a powder keg. He's liable to explode at any time. Jordan said that, basically said that according to his information, Dable's act, the fact that that he's willing to yell at people inside the Giants building, the fact you know he's hard on coaches. I know that much. I've I've been told as much. I know that. I know he's he's not an easygoing guy who's always got a smile on his face. He wants to succeed. He wants to get the best out of coaches. He wants to get the best out of players. These guys work long, incredible hours with a lot of pressure. I'm sure that Brian Dable is hard on coaches. Most NFL head coaches are hard on the people who work for them because their performance is one that that you know the head coach needs these guys to do their jobs well because the head coach is going to lose his job if if things don't go well. So I have no doubt that Brian Dable is hard on the uh, on the coaches who work for him. And you know, Jordan also said that he thought it was po- that there was potential for Dable's act to be wearing thin with some players. I haven't seen that. I haven't sensed it. I haven't been in the Giants locker room in a couple of weeks now, but in my time around the room, in my time around players, I haven't sensed that. But you've got 53 players in that room, plus practice squad players, plus guys on IR. So you've probably got, at any given time, you've got 70, 75 players. I can guarantee you that not every single one of them loves Brian Dable. I can guarantee you that Paris Campbell, a wide receiver who's been inactive the last couple of weeks, probably doesn't love Brian Dable right now. Paris Campbell signed with the Giants thinking he was going to be an impact player. And 
He ended up being relegated to being a kickoff returner. And for the last two or three weeks, he hasn't gotten a uniform on game days. I can guarantee you that Paris Campbell doesn't love Brian Dable. There are probably other guys who aren't playing or not playing as much as they think they'd like to be playing or who don't have the roles that they think they would like to have or deserve to have. I can guarantee you some of those guys don't love Brian Dable right now. And, you know, what happens is, look, this season hasn't gone the way the New York Giants wanted it to, the way they expected it to, the way they hoped it would. When things don't go well, the Giants at one point were one and five, and then they were two and eight. Nerves get frayed. People get on each other's cases. People don't have the patience. You may not see people at their best. Differences that people have become magnified. That, I think, is part of the reason why we've heard so much about the relationship between Brian Dable and Wink Martindale. But listen, as far as the players, I don't know if, I don't know when it comes to relationship with players. I mean, it might be a couple of isolated players who aren't happy, but I don't know. I don't think Brian Dable is in danger of losing the locker room, of of having a revolt. There's two weeks left in the season. Dable's going to be back next year for, for a third year. I'd be shocked if there's any other outcome at this point. Joe Shane is going to be back. So I'm not putting a ton of stock in the fact that there are players who are unhappy, especially since Jordan used the phrase potentially. As I said, I think when you deal with that many players, that many personalities, they're not all going to be happy you know, at any given time, there's always going to be some guys that that aren't thrilled, you know, about their role, about what they're being taught, how they're being taught, how they're being used. So I'm just not putting a whole lot of stock into that. What I am interested to see and what I do think will be telling, we've heard a lot about, as I said earlier, the relationship between Dable and Wink Martindale. What I think will be telling is what happens to Brian Dable's coaching staff once the season ends here in a couple of weeks. My understanding is that most position coach contracts are for two years, which means most of the guys that Brian Dable hired when he became Giants head coach, most of those guys will have their contracts up at the end of of this season. We've already heard that running backs coach Jeff Nix Nixon is in line to become offensive coordinator at Syracuse University. Hasn't been anything official about that yet, but I think, you know, what it seems like that is something that's going to happen. We could well see Wink Martindale decide to move on or Dable and Martindale decide to part ways. I've said before, I hope that doesn't happen. I think Martindale is good at his job. I think that Martindale is a coordinator who can be left to his own devices and can allow a guy like Brian Dable to do what he does best, which is run the offense, try to fix what's been an offense that hasn't been good enough this year, spend the great majority of his time trying to get that offense right, especially if the Giants are in a situation next year where they draft a quarterback like Jaden Daniels or Michael Penix or J.J. McCarthy or whoever, and they have a young quarterback in the building that they want to develop and that Brian Dable wants to make a priority. A defensive coordinator like Wink Martindale with a vast amount of experience, with the ability to stand on his own two feet, to lead his own group, a guy like that can be immense help to Brian Dable. And my fingers are crossed that those two guys work out their differences if indeed there are differences, as Jay Glazer of of Fox Sports had reported, because I think it would be best for the Giants if Wink Martindale returned next year. But I think, as I said, Nixon is probably going to be gone. Wink could be gone. I think we could see a scenario where offensive coordinator Mike Kafka goes. We might see a scenario where special teams coordinator Thomas McGahee moves on. McGahee's been the Giants special teams coordinator through, I believe, three head coaches now. And 
things haven't always gone well. We've seen Brian Dable get after Thomas McGahee a couple times during games. The performance on special teams hasn't always been what you want. It might be time for a change there. Don't know what other position coaches might move on. There's going to be a lot of head coach changes in the NFL for the 2024 season. You hear estimates of seven to 10 jobs that could come open. And, you know, some of those, some of those changes have already been made. Some of those head coaches, you know, Carolina, for example, in, in Las Vegas, you know, those jobs have already come open and, you know, fingers crossed by the way that Antonio Pierce, former giant gets that job in Las Vegas. I think he's done really well there and deserves the full-time gig you know, after uh, spending the last few weeks as interim head coach of the Raiders. But what you're going to have is a situation where there are a lot of openings, a lot of new head coaches. Guys who are on the Giants staff as position coaches might have options. You know, a guy like Dre Patterson, who's a a terrific defensive line coach, might have options. A guy like Jerome Henderson, a really good defensive backs coach, might have options. You don't know with you know, with firings, you don't know who's going to come available who might be really good as a as an offensive line coach or or a linebacker's coach or or whatever. You don't know who's going to come available who might have, you know, connections to Brian Dable. But I think it's going to be interesting to see how that coaching staff shakes out, how many changes are made. I think some changes are inevitable. And perhaps if the changes are far reaching with the coordinators, that may not be a good sign for Brian Dable. It may not be a good thing. We've seen in Philadelphia, for example, where they lost both coordinators after going to the Super Bowl a year ago. And I think losing both coordinators has had an adverse effect on the Eagles. There are those who think losing Eric Bieniemy has had an adverse effect on the Kansas City Chiefs offense, with Bieniemy now in Washington running the Commanders offense. So, changing coordinators, especially if if the Giants have to change two or three of them, may not be a great sign for Brian Dable. But we'll see how things unfold. And, uh, you know, it'll be uh, that will be one of many, many interesting things that uh, that will happen during the the upcoming offseason for the New York Giants. All right, I wanted to talk about a couple of other topics here as well. I wanted to mention, you know, a guy that we just probably haven't given enough credit in the uh, over the last couple of years is Giants wide receiver Darius Slayton. Before the 2022 season when Brian Dable and Joe Shane took over, I looked at Darius Slayton and I thought he was probably a guy who was going to be cut because of a salary cap situation. Slayton took a pay cut, bided his time, barely saw the field for the first three or four weeks, ended up leading the Giants in receiving yards, despite I'm not even sure if he had a catch until week four of the season, still led the Giants in receiving yards. Darius Slayton's now in his fifth NFL season. He is once again the Giants' leading wide receiver in terms of receiving yards. He's headed toward being the Giants' leader in receiving yardage for the fourth year out of his five NFL seasons. And he's headed toward his fourth year of more than 700 receiving yards. Darius Slayton is not Jamar Chase. He's not Tyreek Hill. He's not A.J. Brown. He's not, you know, a guy. He's not Odell Beckham in his prime. He's not a guy who's going to get you 1,200, 1,300, 1,500 receiving yards. He's not going to get you 110 catches. But this guy is a good NFL player. He's worked really hard to, to fix the primary issue that he has had as a wide receiver, which is drops throughout the course of his career. 
He may have only dropped a couple of passes this year. I don't have the exact number in front of me, but that really has not been an issue for him in 2023. Just wanted to mention that Darius Slayton, fifth round pick back in 2019, the year that the Giants selected Daniel Jones in in round one. This is tremendous value for a fifth round pick. This is a guy... As I said, four seasons now, he's less than 100 yards from getting to 700 receiving yards for the fourth time in five years. He's 150 yards clear of Darren Waller, who's second on the Giants in receiving yards. So no matter what happens, it's almost certain that Slayton will lead the Giants in receiving yards for the fourth time in five years. Just wanted to mention, you know, To give credit where credit is due, Darius Slayton, a really, really good NFL player, probably underappreciated, probably doesn't get enough credit. Maybe he would put up better numbers in Kansas City. Maybe he would put up better numbers, you know, with Josh Allen as his quarterback. Maybe he would put up better numbers, you know, with Justin Herbert as his quarterback. I don't know for sure, but... Slayton deserves credit, and uh, and I do hope that that he stays with the Giants. He'll be uh, he's in the first year of a two year deal, and and he deserves to stay. So I hope that happens. I actually hope that uh, that that maybe the Giants work out a, an extension with Slayton and keep him for a couple more years at least. Good player, tremendous value for a fifth round pick. Just wanted to give uh, to to give the young man some credit. All right, I wanted to mention a couple of things that Brian Dable talked about during his Tuesday uh, news conference, his Zoom call with New York media that that I happened to be to be on. And one of the things that Dable was asked were we're into week seventeen, two games left in a season where the Giants are five and ten are out of playoff contention where, as far as the fan base is concerned, the thing that matters is draft position, not whether the Giants win either of the last two games, one against the Rams and and a season-ending game against the Eagles. Dable was asked if he would back off of heavily used star players like Saquon Barkley, Who's playing in the games that uh, that he has that he has played? He's playing, I think, seventy nine point eight percent of this of the possible snaps that he could have played. He's carrying an extremely heavy workload. I think Christian McCaffrey is the only running back in the league that I've been able to find who's playing a higher percentage of his team's snaps than Barkley. In the game the other day, Barkley had 23 carries, a couple of receptions as well. He's getting a ton of touches, getting a lot of wear and tear on that body. Also, Dexter Lawrence has been playing through a hamstring injury for a few weeks, been on a pitch count for about three or four weeks now. Dable was asked if uh, if he would back off of those guys considering the situation, and he said no. He said if they're ready to go, they're going to play. You know, Brian Dable wants to win games, period. He wants to try to win games. He's not worried about the draft position at this point. As far as Dable is concerned, the the fewer losses on his resume, the better. The fewer, you know, if if he can if he can have a a seven and ten season instead of a five and twelve season, that's what he's going to try to do. So guys like Barkley. Guys like Dexter Lawrence, guys like Xavier McKinney and Bobby O'Karake, who have played every single defensive snap so far this season. An incredible accomplishment. 1,001 defensive snaps through 15 games for those two players. O'Karake, who's played through a variety of injuries and, uh, you know, rib injuries, shoulder injuries finger injuries, all kinds of things that that Okereke has played through. 1,001 snaps for those two guys. 
they're not going to be rotated in and you know in and out of games the last couple of weeks to get them some rest. They'll have the they'll have the off season to rest. Brian Dable is going to try to win football games as just about any coach probably would. He's going to play his best players and, and try to win football games. Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about Evan Neal. We knew, you know, before Christmas, we knew last week that the Giants were placing Neal on injured reserve with his second ankle injury of the season. Played only seven games in his second year. Didn't play well. Lost, you know, a half a season or more of potential development in what was really expected to be a critical season for him. And uh, Dayball said on Tuesday that it looks like Evan Neal is headed for postseason surgery on, uh, on his ankle. And that is yet another problem for the Giants in terms of how to structure their 2024 offensive line. You're looking at Evan Neal and, you know, Joe Shane – said in response to my question a few weeks ago that he still believes Evan Neal can play right tackle. And now maybe that was just Joe Shane trying to give the young man some confidence while this season was still going on and while there was still a possibility that Neal would be back in the lineup and would have to play right tackle. But you now have a complicating factor with Evan Neal. In addition to the fact that you're not sure he can play right tackle at the NFL level. And you really can't go into 2024 and hand him the right tackle job. Even if you leave him at tackle, you have to have a viable starting alternative, whether that is Tyree Phillips, whether that is a young draft choice, whether that is a free agent signee, you have to have a viable alternative for him to compete with. If you want to move Evan Neal inside to guard, I know a lot of people have said left guard because he played that position at Alabama for a year. And theoretically, if he plays there well, that would be a good, having him next to Andrew Thomas would be a nice combo uh, for the Giants to build with on that side of the line. But if if Neal has off-season surgery, then he spends at least part, if not all, of his offseason rehabbing that ankle rather than really training. If you want to move him to guard, he loses a lot of time in terms of working on the stance, working on the skills, working on the techniques of playing guard. Even if you want to leave him at right tackle, he loses, as he's already lost half a season, he loses even more time when he could be working with Duke many many weather working you know with with people to to help him get better as an NFL player all of that time is going to be spent rehabbing an ankle that was surgically repaired and and that for me is yet another complicating factor for the Giants with Evan Neal heading into the 2024 season it simply complicates what you do with Neil, how you structure the offensive line, what you do in the offseason in terms of the draft and free agency, in terms of what positions you really target, and what your expectations are for Evan Neal in year three. He's at a point, as I've said before, where you can't hand him a starting job next year, whether it's guard or tackle. He's got to be placed in a competition. And if he wins it, great. If he doesn't win it, then you know, then he's a swing player at you know, at uh, at guard, at tackle, you know, wherever he. You know, if he doesn't win whatever competition you put him in, then so be it. But you can't, the way things have gone the first two years for Neil, you can't guarantee him a job at this point in time. Anyway, Giants fans, I think that's enough for uh, for today. Thank you as always for listening. Hope to have uh, someone from the Believe in Los Angeles Rams podcast as a guest on Friday for a crossover show. So please look forward to that. Still uh, working to arrange that as I, as I do this show here. So anyway, Giants fans, thank you for listening. 
Please stay safe out there. Take care of each other, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye-bye.